Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. As always, I'm your host, Mike Murray. Thrilled today to have our guest, Dr. Josh White, join us. Josh is a longtime associate head coach at the University of Michigan, now very happily here as one of my teammates at Fitter and Faster. Josh White, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? So what's your role now in Fitter and Faster, Josh? What are some of the things that you're doing with this company? So I've been doing some clinics, but I've also been working to develop some more clinics, particularly uh, geared towards putting people on a pathway to elite performance, uh, taking them that that next step uh, above and beyond what they might be doing, even if they're training intensely with their clubs. That's awesome. And do you find that it's helping you stay in touch with the sport? You know, you're kind of looking for new opportunities, new things all the time. Is this something that helps keep you grounded in the sport? Yeah, I love it. It's it, In many respects, it gives me an opportunity to interact with other coaches more. Uh, when I was coaching, I did interact with other coaches, obviously, but lots of athlete interaction. And this has been a great opportunity. Had people reaching out to me to, to chat and getting to go out and see other coaches. And it's been an awesome opportunity just to see that breadth of what people are doing and how they're how they're doing it. Josh, you've worked with athletes <clears throat> at a very high level and a very high performance level from the Olympic Games and the U.S. national team and NCAA champions and NCAA championship. What are some of the things that you've learned coaching athletes at that level that maybe separates the cream of the crop from everybody else? I think uh, ultimately the athletes that end up being the cream of the crop are often looking for more. Right. And and you have to hold them back a little bit as opposed to talking them into doing something. Um, you have to talk them out of doing too much. Right. Uh, or direct or, you know, I think um, they don't want to do less, but get the same results. They want to do things as efficiently as possible to get the best possible results with what they're putting in, which is a lot. Right. No doubt about it. And it's a great segue into my next question, which is. You're categorized kind of as a distance coach or even a, a distance guru, right? As we like to use these different monikers in our sport. Why do you think that is? And talk to us about your philosophy. How do different athletes line up based on, you know, their their genetic background, their physiology that's so unique? You know, what? how do you categorize athletes? Sure, sure. So I think um, I would consider myself to be an aerobically based coach as opposed to a distance coach. Uh, and I think it's natural that people think of me as a distance coach because those are where the athletes, some of the athletes I've had have been most successful. But I also coached, uh, I think, three of the last four Big Ten champions and 100 butterfly on the men's side, right? So um, sometimes people are aerobically based, but also very fast. Uh, we know, you know, a, aerobic and anaerobic athletes, it's not a single line, right? It's not a continuum from aerobic to anaerobic. They're two separate axes, right? So when I've been lucky enough to coach athletes that were both aerobically gifted and anaerobically gifted, uh, then, then they also went really fast in, in events. Um, and uh, so um, I, got, I lost my train of thought there. Remind me of the of the question again. I apologize. No, just you were talking a little bit about how uh, you categorize different athletes. So that's oh, sure. Yeah. And I think that's the, the thing uh, as a coach for me is I believe that we're training athletes. We're not training events, right? So just because someone swims one event doesn't mean you're always going to train them in the same way. And that's on both ends of the spectrum. Um, I've coached a guy, Tony Wall, way back in the day. And Tony swam the 400 IM, the 500 free, and the 200 fly. But we figured out that uh, he needed to train in the sprint group the majority of the time, except when we were doing race-specific work. And he ended up being hugely successful in those events. So it goes, I think, both directions. Um, what we're looking at is, hey, what are the, what's the physiology of, of each athlete? And 
how can we train them to be the best they can be? And, and my belief is other than maybe the extremes of open water or say a 25 to maybe a 50 freestyle, that if we work to unlock their physical potential, they're probably going to be the best across their entire range of events, uh, as opposed to needing to train one way specifically or another. The, the 50 or a 25 or a 10K, you're going to have to do something uh, that might compromise them in other events. But uh, but for the most part, if you can train them as an individual physiologically, then they're going to be the best across their entire range. I coached a, a Danish man named Honors Nielsen, uh, and Honors uh, could split in the low 19s, I think 19-1 or 19-2 in the 50. Uh, his freshman year, he was ninth at NCAAs in the mile, 1446. His senior year, he made the B final in the 100 free, uh, and he was great at the two and the five, obviously. But we really didn't train change his training too much uh, between those those opportunities. What a great sound bite for club coaches, right? Who have athletes who are going to be swimming a wide range of events in the time that you're working with them, from the time they're an eight and under all the way through 18. You know, I, I think it's unfair even to, to pigeonhole 17, 18 year old boys and girls into certain events just based on their proclivity to want to swim it or be open to swim it. We try to swim every event at Victor Swim Club. I think it's a really important part of their development. So. I, I love hearing that. And then you, you mentioned Anders, but there's also been guys like Us Maluli who had a huge range. Reich Niefling had a huge range. And and all three of those athletes kind of continued on in the sport for a long, long time. So I'm going to bring up that, that age-old argument that we hear in contemporary coaching so much this day and age. Is there an aerobic base? <laughs> That's Yeah, I've seen a couple things on that. Uh, recently. And I would tell you, in my opinion, yes, there is an aerobic pace. Um, you, you know, first of all, when you look at uh, anaerobic development, you could take athletes up to a certain age, there is no anaerobic development, really, right? We're, we're looking at purely aerobic gains. As they get later, that anaerobic system becomes more dominant. At the same time, I think, um, I think that's just a funny question, right? It's a it's a funny question, um, and here's kind of where we get into things of of energy systems and energy system training, right? I think uh, there are things that are truths, and then there are things that are uh, paradigms, right? So there are physiological truths in how energy is produced, right? You've got glycolysis, you've got an oxidative metabolism, you have these anaerobic pathways, you have these aerobic pathways, that everyone would agree on that and those are truths, right? Then when you get into something like energy system training, that's a paradigm for understanding, right? We're trying to understand what goes on in the body. We're trying to be able to be systematic by categorizing different types of work to, to uh, find an optimal way to train some, right? That's not a truth. Right. There is no right or wrong answer to that. There are different ways to approach it. Uh, and I think every training paradigm has its blind spots. Right. Uh, it has times when you have to step outside of it. Um, but to but to throw out uh, a paradigm based on the blind spots doesn't really make a lot of sense either. Right. We have to have some level of explanation now how you choose to go about working. The arguments that I've seen recently against the idea of aerobic base are that you're going to be working the aerobic system when you do anaerobic work. Uh, that's 100% accurate, right? I'm not sure that that answers whether the best way to train a specific person involves doing aerobic work that isn't maximal effort in a sense. Um, and And that's... I think I think you can kind of there's an argument that says, hey, if we just work at maximum effort all of the time, then when we work at maximum effort, whatever's the weakest is going to, to be worked, right? Is going to catch up. So we're just going to exploit the weakest thing. And if that gets better, then everything gets better. That's definitely true, right? Um I would say, yeah, that works. Absolutely. Now. There's another 
plan of attack, which is the plan of attack that I've used coaching, which is an idea of an understanding that, hey, if we understand some of these processes going on, can we work them specifically and individually as opposed to all at once? And will, in a sense, like building that house from the foundation allow you to be, to improve also? And I, and I think that's true as well. So um, can you do it both ways? Yeah, absolutely you can, right? And I think that's the thing about paradigms is when we lose sight of the fact that what we're doing is, is trying to understand through a system uh, and we start to believe that our paradigm is the truth, then I think we we get off base, right? And and then we end up going so far, and I've done this as well as a coach, as I start to believe uh, my paradigm so much, it particularly happens when people want you to talk about it, right? Because now you're talking about it. Now you start to believe your own paradigm so much that you go too far in that direction of believing that it it contains the truth and you forget to fill in those gaps that it has. Yeah, absolutely. And and I heard a lot of really good things in there, Josh. And one of the things that I want to pull out was you mentioned how are we trying to figure out how to be efficient with the different types of training? And it blossomed something in my mind, which was we want to give the athletes the ability to go really, really fast. How important is it to give them the ability to train at a really high level? There's training for performance, and then there's training to to make our physio our, our physiological capability able to produce results in our training. Sure, um, absolutely, and I think it obviously is really important to be able to train fast at some point, right? Um, and I think uh, in coaching, my goal was to train hard and then to train fast, because I believed that for the athletes that I was working with, building that capacity to train hard, then allowed them to train fast more frequently and for longer duration than if I had just trained fast, right? And that's, again, that's the population that you're working with. Um, if Here's what I would say. If you had adult athletes who came and trained with you three times a week, for one hour, then I would do all race specific training, right? The more specific the training is, the better it is until you start to add more and more and more time to it, right? Uh, and then I think, oh, well, if I wanna do race specific training more frequently, then I have to be able to recover faster. Do I believe that doing aerobic work uh, at the beginning of the season without that maximum effort allows you at the end of the season to do more maximum effort work and recover for the next bout, I do. Sure. I hear, I hear a little bit of Bob Bowman in there with capacity versus utilization, right? Really, really important for people to understand. You know, Josh, there are so many different dynamics and modalities and models that coaches can use uh, as far as energy systems go and understanding energy training. There was 3S for a long time. There's the, the Urban Check model, which we'll talk about. There's, there's your model that's kind of expounded upon that. There's McGleish Clo, there's Sweetenham and Atkinson, there's Jan Albrecht, right? There are all these different models. And I really try to encourage coaches to explore the one that works best for you. Now, as a coach, you know, you're pretty much well known for using some of the colors. Why are using the colors? easy for you and your program to put into place and put your athletes through that system? Yeah, I think uh, one of the big uh, benefits of it is communication, right? Um, I feel like when you're working with large staffs, right? We, we had a staff of six at Michigan. Uh, we want to be able to communicate with one another in a way that we understand. We want to be able to communicate with our athletes uh, a little understanding of purpose as well, right? Understanding the purpose in what we do is really important to all of us. Uh, and if as an athlete, I go into a workout with an understanding of purpose, not only am I more motivated, but I'm also more likely to accomplish the purpose that the coach had intended, right? Um, a lot of the colors at the, at the upper end, the harder side of things, 
really, I think the onus is on the coach to make the set appropriate to hit that energy system, as opposed to the athlete, uh, you know, having to know these minute details of exactly where they're supposed to be working. They really know, hey, if I see something uh, red, blue, brown, purple, green, I'm just going as hard as I can through the set. But it might be a way to approach the set or an understanding of what technique I want to use in the set or how many underwater kicks I should expect from myself coming off the wall so that they can have more of a level of specificity to their training that has to be applied at the individual level. Um, so I think that that communication uh, aspect it was really a great uh, key of, of our of our color system, both between coaches uh, and within. And then it's uh, having the opportunity to improve year to year or try new things, right? I think um, when I was recruiting, I always likened it to throwing darts at a dartboard, right? Uh, you throw a dart at a dartboard, if it's up and to the right of the bullseye, then the next one you throw a little bit further down and to the left, right? That's having any system. It doesn't have to be energy systems or colors or whatever, but it's any system. And as you're saying, there are a lot of dis different systems out there for understanding. Uh, but if we don't have any system and we just go off feel, one, I know from watching Law & Order, uh, so many times that eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable. Uh, what I think I did last year, I probably didn't do. Or I remember one set. Uh, it happens with athletes a lot. They remember the best set they ever had. And then they come back and they're like, well, that wasn't as good as the best set I ever had. Uh, but the rest of the season wasn't very good. you know. Um, and then... Uh, you know, I think if you don't have any system for categorization to make to make tweaks and you end up, it's like throwing the dart and then going and having a sip of your soda or other beverage and then coming back and throwing the dart again, it's just like throwing it the first time. It doesn't give you that structure to improve. Uh, so for for us, for me, I think the the colors we use were a great system that allowed us to kind of categorize and understand one aspect of our work. Right. Obviously, there are so many different aspects of what you're doing in coaching and the things that you're focusing on that maybe aren't that aren't categorized by the color system. And that's why I say it's it's not um, a truth. Right. It's not a way to success. It's a it's a tool. And I think um, all of those different systems uh, use those tools to their advantage. Um, we use colors for essentially everything. John used colors for some things and other things were fast, easy, right? But it was the way that he was using them and understanding them that it made him successful. For sure. And you're talking largely about uh, the nuanced art of coaching, right? Right, right. And understanding your system, how it works, but also not being a slave to the system. 100%. Yeah. So are you ready to take us through some of these colors? Sure. Yeah. Do you want to pull them up? I can, whatever is easier for you. Let's see. Maybe if you've got, that might be easier for me. Okay. Let's see. Or I can try. All right. There we go. Perfect. That was the one I was going to pull up. Right. So. Awesome. Um, so taking, going through the colors. Right. I think one of the things that we decided to do was that we wanted to have an event distance that was in some ways associated with each color. Right. And there's a range there as well. So because we put everything in the color system, uh, we have some colors down there that you don't necessarily aren't tied to anything really physiologically per se. So. Our yellow was our warm up, warm down. Um, what differentiated that between that and our orange, which we might use more for low aerobic, for drilling, for things like that, was just an understanding that when you're doing yellow, you can flop around in the pool, you can bounce off the bottom, you can float on your back, right? There's a freedom there to do whatever you want. But with orange, we want you to be focused in on what you're doing. I think one of the biggest 
ways we would work to build good habits and good technique is if we go hard with the best technique we can, and then we go easy after, but with the best technique we can, then that allows us to, in a sense, extend that period of best technique. So if we're doing something active rest, for example, and you go really hard and you feel like you can't keep going, but then and you go with good technique, but slower, that's the first step in being able to hold good technique for longer, right? Um, white was probably our, our least used color, uh, to be honest with you. Um, it, it's, it's not, there's nothing bad about it in a sense, but didn't feel like it's developing much. It was more like a stepping stone in, uh, uh, in the descend, for example. Um, Pink, essentially pink is is the threshold, right? It's not work on the threshold, but it is the threshold. So if we did a, a 3,000 for time that was a motivated, well-paced swim, then that would be the pink pace, uh, plus or minus, right? Pink is the long, you can hold pink theoretically until you run out of carbohydrate fuel, right? Um, that's kind of the balance where our like glycolytic system is producing carbon atom. Like the glycolytic system takes a six carbon atom and breaks it into two, three carbon atoms. And then our oxidative metabolism takes those two, three carbon atoms and turns them into single carbons, which we breathe out in carbon dioxide. And it needs oxygen to turn it into carbon dioxide, right? Um, and it gains energy through there. So at pink, we're essentially matching the pace, the fastest that aerobic system can can run while they're matched. Now, if you overload the system, it actually runs faster. So that's kind of the subtle part is that even though this is the longest sustainable effort, like your aerobic system will run harder in red, it will actually run even harder in blue, but they're not sustainable. Um, and you can think of it like any normal chemical reaction, right? In a chemical reaction, if you have a lot of reagents, if there are um, a lot of the substrate around, it drives the reaction faster to produce the product, right? It's kind of the same idea where if there's, if that uh, glycolysis system is kicking out and there are all these three carbon atoms around, it's actually going to... Uh, allow that uh, oxidative system to run faster. But that's kind of pink. Red we use to work on that threshold. So we're pushing above it and then we're resting below it. And then we're pushing above it and then we're resting below it. So we're running that aerobic system a little bit faster. It's not a sustainable condition, but we recover so that we can maintain that effort. Um, I would say, in my opinion, a well-trained athlete uh, at the end of the season, shaved and tapered can do a mile at red in a row. Other than that, I don't think you can get to red for that entire like length of a, of a 1500, 1650, which in part is why in coaching distance athletes, we didn't do a lot of in-season 1650s in the college season because I felt like really then you're doing a 1650 pink. Uh, when you could have been doing a thousand red in the meat, and you maybe get more benefit from doing a thousand red in the meat as opposed to the sixteen fifty pink. It makes sense. Would you uh, have I heard you refer to that type of work in the in the high end pink, maybe low end red as like aerobic spice? So aerobic spice is a little bit is a little bit different. It's it's something I stole from uh, Jan Ulbricht's book, and then maybe. Uh, and then maybe shifted it in directions a little bit. But um, so the aerobic spice idea is that, uh, you know, mitochondria is where oxidative metabolism, aerobic metabolism happens in the cell. The idea is that there's some research that suggests that you produce new mitochondria under essentially anaerobic work conditions. You go as fast as you can, that helps make new ones. But if you want to improve the processes and grow them, that's more of an aerobic action. So by combining those two and going back and forth, you can get a great aerobic benefit while doing anaerobic work that would be, we used, we did a lot of it with like green work, 
uh, or green work that bordered on kind of purple work. Like purple work is more, um, some might call it lactate tolerance. Uh, I know a, a true physiologist would correct that and say that's not exactly, uh, it's more like a tolerance of acidosis or maybe, you know, product buildup or or whatnot, but, but that's a term that's commonly used. Um, but it wasn't exactly that, but maybe bordered on that, mixed with lower aerobic swimming. Um, so we might do something, we would, it might not surprise you, but I love to do progressions and patterns and things. Uh, that's just the way that my mind works a bit. So we might start the year doing a couple sets of 425s, fast on 30, uh, green combined in the, and a, maybe a 50 fast a couple times as well in a 7,000 yard workout, right? And then that's aerobic spice. Great opportunity to work technique in there as well, because we're doing a lot of our work in orange, a little bit in white and pink, Um but, but mainly orange work in between. So that's kind of the, the aerobic spice. Um, that for some reason, I think I've become somewhat associated with, but even though it's not my term, people some people believe it to be my term, but I stole it uh, <laughs> uh, and used it and then shifted it, right? And I think that's really the beauty of coaching um, is you get to take these concepts, you get to take these understandings and then understandings and then make them your own. And you're a better coach and they're a better system for you and your athletes because of that. Absolutely. So we're moving so, from our red, I think now into blue. I love to so live in blue. Blue is that concept of VO2 max. It actually is the fastest that your aerobic system can run. It's the most oxygen that you can consume in a period of time, right? Uh, but it isn't a sustainable workload, right? Because you actually have to have that glycolytic system running fast enough that it makes it unsustainable. Um, that corresponds with like 400 IM or free, 500 free type of duration that you can hold that. And I think that's also why it's an important to work in. And now when you start to see things that are uh, associated with a pace, what you're going to see is really, it's a range of pace, right? So in, in, from a practical perspective in a workout, we would use it to describe anything that might be from, let's say you came in that day, you warmed up, you did a 500 as fast as you could from the blocks. What's your average pace in that? That's the bottom end. And then either shaved and tapered or maybe even goal pace is the top end of that zone, right? And then as you go up uh, to brown there, that's associated with 200 pace. The bottom end of that, again, is what could you go in a 200 if I bring you into practice that day, warm you up, you go a 200 from the blocks to shaved and tapered, et cetera. But you can see how those kind of, mesh up right at any given day in the in the beginning of this or middle of the season if i come and i have you warm up and i go at 200 from the blocks i believe you'd go approximately the first 200 of your 500 from your best time right that'd be a good swim so they butt up against one another so these are zones still as opposed to like this is specific to your 200 pace right um it's work that will help your 200, but it's not specific, that specific. And Brown was one that we kind of added in um, because if you look like Mike uh, brought with him platinum, gold, those are both like ATP, CP. So they're essentially, people say they're three energy systems, right? I tend to think of it as two ener two systems that produce energy. And one is a rechargeable battery. So the ATP CP system is a rechargeable battery, right? You're not actually creating energy You're cre in that system. You're creating it in either aerobic metabolism or glycolysis, but you're storing it there so it's easily accessible. It's immediately accessible. It's ready to go. Uh, so the ATP CP uh, system, Mike was like, hey, in a sense, this is an adaptation of the colors beyond energy systems, where 
he wanted power and he wanted speed, right? That's introducing, I would, in my mind, you've got energetic concerns and then you've got neuromuscular concerns, right? Uh, when you're looking at platinum versus gold, there's a neuromuscular differentiation, even though it's in the context of our, of our energy system, our energetic uh, system. So uh, my big thing was, I felt like when you go from blue to a purple or a green, some people were using purple to categorize all anaerobic work. Uh, there just seemed to be the, the area that we operate in mostly uh, as coaches, as athletes competing is in this zone where it's beyond sustainable aerobic work, but it's not all out, right? So, okay, we need to have some more zones in here. Again, not because uh, you can do the same set if you call it purple and purple and brown are the same thing. You could do the same set and get the same benefit, right? But in terms of communicating or categorizing what we're doing, felt like that was too big of a category. And so we added sort of that 200 specific work then, uh, you know, true or untrue at all. My, my, my theoretical breakdown was that it's about 65% of the energy uh, coming from, from the uh, anaerobic system and 35 from the aerobic. I'm sorry, I got that. I flipped that 65 from the aerobic 35 from the anaerobic. Right. Uh, but of course, then if you look at individual athletes uh, swimming in that system, they're probably going to have different uh, differentiation. So not super important, but it is, I felt like important for us to have that category to, to be able to narrow things down a little bit more. Um, purple, we talked about a little before, we would use that as, in a sense, uh, tolerance work. Um, some, you know, essentially were, and that would tell our athletes a different way to approach the set, right? If we're doing a brown set, uh, that has four fifties of brown in it, then we want to be try to be even paced across the four fifties, right? If we're doing a purple set that's three fifties, the first one should be as fast as you can possibly go. It's really probably green, and then the second one is getting towards purple, and then the third one would be really pure purple. Sure. Uh, and then green is sort of that. Um, lactate production that's running our glycolytic system as fast as we possibly can uh, and trying to give enough rest that we can continue to run it as fast as we can. So it, in a sense, it's a lactate production. Um, and I've kind of danced around this uh, and I don't know if I need to speak to it directly, but um, you know, lactate is a great tool for measuring what's going on inside the cell uh, because blood lactate levels were measurable and corresponded with fatigue. Uh, lactate sort of got uh, labeled as a source of fatigue, which it, it really isn't. It's just a different three carbon sugar. Um, you know, you take glucose, which is that six carbon and in glycolysis, it breaks it in half, gets energy from doing that. And then you have these two three carbon atoms sitting around and what does your body do with them? Well, it tries to break them into one carbon atoms first, but if there are too many to do that, then it wants to get them out of the cell. And how does it get them out of the cell? It changes them slightly from being something called pyruvate to something called lactate. And when it turns lactate, then they can be removed from the cell and put into the bloodstream. But they can go somewhere else and be used as fuel for the aerobic system. In particular, uh, there are two muscles that love to consume lactate, your heart and your diaphragm muscle, right? Your heart and your diaphragm don't have glycolytic pathways because you can't afford for them to fail, right? You don't, you don't continue living if, if you stop breathing or if your heart stops beating. So they don't have, they don't produce lactate. They don't produce pyruvate. They don't have that glycolytic pathway, but they can consume it. So uh, your diaphragm that helps you, you breathe or is the main source of, of breathing muscularly uh, will consume it all day and love it. And uh, 
there have actually been a lot of successful studies that show if you train, you can train uh, to improve the strength of that muscle, the energy systems of your diaphragm, and then you'll actually have a, a lactate sink uh, that will allow you to work harder in your other muscles. But lactate um, is fuel. That's so important. Lactate is fuel. Coaches. Lactate's fuel. Lactate is fuel, but it is it, it is also a great way to understand what's going on inside the cell. So, absolutely. And then we're getting into gold and and platinum. Gold and platinum. So, like I said, both of those are are in a sense the same energy system. They're ATP CP. So, uh, ATP is the primary. Uh, fuel, right? It is the fuel that is actually used by the muscles that causes the muscles to contract. When ATP loses a phosphate group, it goes from being ATP adenosine triphosphate to ADP adenosine diphosphate, and it releases energy. You have ATP sitting in your cell ready to be used so that your body responds right away. And then CP is creatine phosphate, which is essentially the same idea. Creatine uh, can exist without the phosphate group. It can hold the phosphate group. As soon as ATP starts to become ADP, the phosphate group will jump from the creatine to, to recharge that a ADP into ATP. So those are very short duration, six seconds, right? This might be working on a power rack. It's a burst, okay? Normally we do them. I, can that energy system be trained? I'm not sure how much it can be trained, right? But you get a lot of other great training effects by work energy system. Those are neurological effects, muscular effects, right? So because we're working in that system to induce neurological muscular effects, we broke it into two. Mike broke it into two and said, "Hey, I want to. I want one that says." and power work. That's muscular in nature. I want one that's speed work. That's going to be primarily neurological in nature. So I want to be able to, to know when I'm training one of those things versus the other so that I can induce introduce that subtlety into, into what I'm doing. I love it, Josh. And when we think about using these color systems, and I know coaches will, will email me with, with questions on them. When we think about using these color systems, there's also ways to test your athletes throughout the course of the year. So were there some test sets that you like to use? And we know you're a big pattern guy and progression guy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your test sets and how you measured? Sure. We have done a lot of different types of test sets over the year. Um, the one we probably used most frequently was uh, essentially 10 300s of, of red work. A uh, short course that might be on 320 for men, for women, maybe 330. Um, really, our middle distance swimmers would do eight in a row and our distance would do 10 in a row. The middle distance got a couple to build into it. Uh, but that's probably the biggest one. Um, that's one that I got from working with John. Uh, one of my favorite memories of working with John, and I, and I tell this story because I think it tells you a lot about um, that coaching is based on science, but it is an art, uh, is that we would get back after doing the test set and plug the numbers in, and then John would pick somebody out and be like, ah, that wasn't right for them, and just change it, uh, because he used a lot of pace charts, uh, and he wanted it to be right for the pace chart, and he knew what they should have gone. Right. <laughs> he knew what they did go. He also knew what they should have gone. And he adjusted a little bit so that if they had a bad day or they had a particularly good day, he might adjust it down to decrease the expectation on them from a training perspective. But I think that kind of goes to show show you how um, there's a science to it. He was using science. He was generating face charts, but he also needed to know his athletes well enough uh, to do it. And other than that, truthfully, um, we more played around with them than used them as a systematic marker of where people were in their training. Um, I think probably there's some good basis for this outside of sport in the literature, but athletes now 
uh, tended to get more hyper-focused on the results of a test set, and it tended to be more of a source of stress uh, than the benefit gained from it. Um, so we used less and less of them in a sense to, to accommodate, you know, changes in, in athlete uh, mentality around those things. Um, that was just with the population we had. And, you know, again, it's not, I believe there's so many different ways to do things and so many tools that can be used effectively that I, that anything I say is about more of uh, things that were successful for me, as opposed to, I believe this is right, or I believe that is wrong. Um, but that's just kind of how we uh, shifted a bit um, into looking at things. And then the other aspect being essentially that learning, that understanding from John that if I, the, one of the other things John did that I think he, he is really proud of um, that he would share with a lot of people was he'd have kind of this idea of, okay, if I do this set and I go this time, this is where I'm on track to compete against the, at the end of the year. Again, with John, it wasn't predictive so much as motivational. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I want to go this at the end of the year, here's what I need to do every day in practice. Um, but, but I think what it really showed was, hey, uh, as a coach, if you're attentive to what's going on in practice, if you're paying attention to your athletes, and if you have few enough of them that you can mentally keep track of it, then you're going to have an idea of um, what's good based on the amount of rest that you're doing in that set, the number of repetitions. Uh, I like to, as a coach, not repeat sets super frequently. Uh, maybe, maybe three times a year at max, we would repeat a set. Uh, there might be only subtle differences we might repeat them year to year at about the same time. Obviously, there were favorites because they're like, oh, this is something that uh, really got the, we we worked exactly where we wanted to, right? People were in the right space. They were working on the things that we wanted to from an energetic perspective. But I think uh, we started to rely more on sort of a general understanding of, hey, okay, if we're doing 10 100s on, 120 this week and 130 next week we know the ones on 130 are going to be faster uh we know what might be good for the person we know which person might gain more from having additional 10 seconds rest and which person might gain less from having an additional 10 seconds rest so that again we could have an idea of are we right doing a test set for the most part is are we progressing in our training are we as are our bodies adapting the way that we want uh and i think we we tried to kind of take uh, that more from like a general knowledge of each athlete. Now, obviously, when you've got 60 athletes and six coaches, that's a lot easier to do than if you have 60 athletes with one or two coaches. Um, so we were fortunate to have that approach. I think if you had a greater number of people, fewer coaches, then that's a tool that I would have relied on a lot more for for trying to to track and understand uh, uh, progress. Absolutely. And, you know, we're finding ourselves getting stuck in the weeds often as coaches this day and age. We have wearable technologies. We have test set results. We have all these numbers and analytics, but it's important to understand that they're tools and they're not necessarily the truth. Yes, 100%, right? Exactly like energy systems, right? This is information. These are tools. This is a system, but it is not the truth. Uh, and and you have to be able to use uh, use them as such. Yeah, for sure, Josh. In in the last, I would say eight to twelve years, American distance swimming has come back, right? And and it was kind of initiated by the work that you were doing with Connor Yeager at Michigan. He he made some breakthrough performances from an American standpoint in distance. Talk about the trajectory of these last three quads and, and how exciting it is to see some of these young kids, club kids, making an impact at the distance level. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a lot of fun to see. And it's an area I can't remember. I wish I could remember who I was talking to, but I was talking to a club coach who was basically like, uh, well, if, tell, told his athletes, well, if you want to make junior nationals and you're not making it, 
there's more of an opportunity in the distance events. And that's something that I always loved is that those are opportunity events, right? Um, it is, uh, you have to train hard. You have to be willing to do the difficult training. Now, my personal view is that athletes across every event have the opportunity to train hard or not train hard. A distance training is different than sprint training. But if you were to see a sprint, a sprinter, uh, I got to watch George Bavel when he was training with, with Mike do some of these uh, sets or, or Mike Kavik uh, doing some of these sets. And if you don't think those guys were in pain uh, at the end of it, then, then you're confused, right? Uh, there's, there's a willingness to run into a brick wall as a sprinter that you have to have. Uh, and, and it's different than distance training, but, but equally, equally difficult, but for whatever reason, um, I think culturally, unfortunately, there's been a, a, a stigma of distance swimming, that it is harder or more tedious uh, or less glamorous for whatever reason. Uh, I think that one of the great things that happens when you have people who start to be successful in those realms is that 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 is that glamour is reestablished. There's someone there's a role model uh, to look after. And I think. Um, you know, what we want is that continued depth of distance, right? The the more depth we have in the United States in distance training and distance competition, the more we're going to get those top performers, right? Um, and when we have those waxing and waning of performance in those events, it's really about not having the same depth of people in the event from which we're going to get those popcorn kernels that pop at the highest level, right? Um, and so it's been uh, fun to see Bobby do so well. You know, I, I would bristle a little bit because it it's funny. We I think sometimes that's forgotten and you'd hear commentators because Bobby won a gold. Uh, that's when American Distance Swimming came back even though in 2016, we were second and fourth in the mile, which is really pretty good to have two of the top uh, swimmers on the, in, in the world on the men's side. And on the women's side, obviously, uh, we've had that depth uh, and continue to have that, that depth, even with Katie at the top over and over. There are people who are working their way up the chain and, and battling to be uh, to beat her, truthfully. And that's the, the great thing about young athletes. And I think that's something that really benefited our distance swimmers at, at Michigan was a, was a, a continuity, right? Uh, we had a guy, Ryan Feely. I don't know if you know Ryan Feely, but uh, Ryan Feely, I love Ryan because uh, while I don't think he ever achieved it, his goal was to make Olympic trials in the 50 uh, through the 10 K. He was on the open water national team. So even though there's no, Olympic trials in the 10 K he considered himself to have achieved that level. Uh, he never made the 50, but he did make the hundred uh, Olympic trials cut. Uh, but Ryan Feely came in and we had Peter Vanderke training with us at the time. And uh, Ryan uh, was like, well, there's no reason Peter should beat me in practice. Right. Well, there were probably a lot of reasons, but I was okay with him not believing that. Right. Uh, and then Sean Ryan came in and he thought he should beat Ryan Feely and Peter Vanderkay in practice every day. And then Connor, who came in not as highly touted as either of those guys, was like, I just want to try to keep up with those guys every day. And I don't see a reason why I shouldn't. Right. And I think that's something that um, I think it's something we do really well in the United States as well. Like if, if you go to a tier pro swim series, you can warm up in a lane with Caleb Dressel or Katie Ledecky, or, you know, these are just humans who have a gift, but they also have worked really hard to be the best they can be. And it, it humanizes that excellence, uh, which I think allows all of us to dream a little more. Yeah, it's the beauty of fitter and faster too, right? And uh, it's the reason why I take my kids to those tier pro series meets and, uh, you know, I remember taking kids to tier pro series meets and uh, having PJ Ransford there too. And uh, he was a tenacious racer. Also got to give a little plug here for Rochester, New York. Oh yeah. PJ. I mean, he was the next in that chain, right? He never believed that, that Connor should, 
should beat him in a in a set. And there was one set in particular. We would do these interval driven sets on Friday afternoon. That PJ was better than than Connor, right? And and uh, consistently consistently pushed Connor. That was that was PJ's. You know he he nailed it. Uh, and then we had Felix Obuck, who's not an American, but but gained a lot from that. And and Felix an incredible distance and middle distance swimmer. And he was not good at short and all sets, uh, but he was great at active rest sets, right? So we all have different strengths um, and weaknesses. And I think I'm going to correct myself because I feel like I probably had three of the last five Big Ten champions in the under butterfly, not three of the last four. That might've been wrong. I don't know. I don't have my uh, results up in front of me, but uh, <laughs> so I don't want to make a claim that's not true. Uh, <laughs> well, Josh, this has been an awesome hour, and uh, we so appreciate your time. What are you most excited about heading into Paris? Ooh, I think for me, the the excitement heading into Paris is really just you know, there's a lot of youth now. There's a lot of changeover uh, in in the sport as a whole, and it's getting the opportunity. Uh, you know, I think these trials meets Olympic trials. The Olympics, um, they just motivate people in that extra level, right? It's it's never being able to get the right number of people at the at the trials meet because once you set the cut, more people are going to make it than statistically would be predicted to, right? Um, I think that's the joy of it every time, and um, I'm I'm excited to to see that and see where we have people. You know, uh, Jaeger, as you mentioned, was one of those people who, you know, the, the Olympic year suddenly uh, came out of nowhere to make the team. And those are always um, special stories. So, Well, for sure. Well, Josh, thanks so much. How can people get in touch with you if they want to ask you some questions? They can email me at my Fitter and Faster account. Perfect. Should I give that? Should I yeah. give that out? Yeah. It's uh, Jay White at fitterandfaster.com, fitter, A-N-D, faster, not the ampersand. So Jay yeah. White at fitterandfaster.com. I love to hear from people. Uh, that's what I love about working with Fitter and Faster is, is again, getting the opportunity to, to hear, learn from other people and share knowledge that I have. Um, it's one of the things I've always enjoyed, so. Well, thanks so much, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank you.